Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Jorge Barraza. I'm a program manager with the Utah Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Uh, thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation on intersectionality and sexual violence work. Uh, I think this is such a critical uh, lens that we have to have when we're doing our work. Um, and so, um, again, you're not able to unmute yourself, but you're welcome to type in the chat if you have any questions. And Andy Tremonti is with here with me, and they will be answering questions on there or replying to the chat or letting me know if there's something I need to know. Um, and also maybe possibly jumping in the conversation as I, as I give this presentation. So uh, let's begin. First of all, the Utah Coalition Against Sexual Assault is a federally recognized statewide coalition uh, for the third that supports the 13 rape crisis centers across the state of Utah. Uh, we provide training and education technical assistance, support for those programs. Uh, and you can also visit us at our website, ucasa.org, to find out, learn more about us. Um, the one direct service we actually do is our 24-hour hotline, uh, which is available in English and in Spanish. Uh, and I'm excited and proud to say that our Spanish line is actually uh, staffed by all native uh you know, Spanish speakers, um, which can really make an impact and a difference. Uh, so please, we do encourage you to let those around you know that we, uh, about those numbers and the service, that service that we offer. When someone contacts us, we'll typically, you know, help them in that moment uh, and then connect them or refer them to their local service provider to gain additional support. One other thing as well, our, um, statewide conference, our 2024 statewide sexual assault conference uh, will be this September, uh, September 12th and 13th. Um, and you can go to our website to learn, learn more about that. And that will take place in Marriott in uh, Provo this year. For this training, uh, we have a couple of objectives. First of all, understanding intersectionality understanding why intersectional lens is critical to sexual violence work, and learning how we can apply an intersectional lens to our work. So let's begin with what is intersectionality to begin with? Intersectionality refers to the social, economic, and political ways in which systems of oppression and privilege connect, overlap, and influence one another. I read it slowly because that's a lot of words. And even when I read it to myself, I have to read it slowly to fully grasp that. Um, so in order to understand intersectionality, we have to understand what systems of oppression are. So a system of oppression and privilege is a societal structure that creates and perpetuates inequities based on social identities like race, gender, sexual orientation, class, disability, and more. It operates on multiple levels. This is an idea that I find a lot of individuals have a hard time recognizing. Uh, I think especially if you do benefit from one of these systems, it's harder to see it uh, because this is just the way the world works. So I want you to take a moment to think of some of the examples of systems of oppression. What are some systems you can think of that creates and perpetuates inequities based on social identities like race, gender, sexual orientation, orientation class, disability, and other characteristics?
here's your list of some of those examples. Again, racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, ableism. And one of the things that um, I have discovered in the years of working in the gender-based violence work is that ableism tends to be one of the last things that we think about uh, when we're thinking about providing, designing, and organizing our services. Um, so it's something that I think is very easy to overlook if we're not conscious about uh, being intentional uh, on looking at, at ableism. But again, there's other forms as well. Ageism, colorism, sexism, sizeism, and others. So how do these work at different levels? At the individual level, um, systems of oppression involve personal beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors that either uphold or challenge the system. It can manifest as a prejudice, discrimination, or microaggressions towards marginalized groups while granting unearned, adva unearned advantages to those in privileged groups. Speaking of these attitudes and beliefs that um, either uphold or challenge the system, one of the things that I have, um, I, I recently heard someone say, and I mean, it's something that a lot of us who work in this field know, but uh, when it comes to systems of oppression, we are either challenging them and working to dismantle them, or we're being complicit with them, if not even intentionally maintaining them. There really isn't a middle ground in there. And as advocates, most individuals that I know that are advocates and work in these fields, uh, work in these fields because they care about people. Um, and so I really think that it's important that we see all the aspects in our life where we can take an opportunity to challenge some of those systems of oppression within our families, our friends, our social groups, schools, churches, our communities in general. At the institutional level, systems of oppression and compassion pol and compassionate policies, practices, and norms within organizations like schools, workplaces, government, and media that systematically disadvantage marginalized groups and favor privileged groups. Some examples include discriminatory hiring practices, unequal access to resources, and bias representat representation in media. One example of such an institutional level of, uh, of oppression uh, would be redlining that occurred in the U.S. Uh, many years ago, and we're still dealing with the outcomes of that, where people of color were not allowed to purchase homes within certain neighborhoods. And that's continued on to, that led to other, you know, disadvantages for those individuals, um, such as when the interstate freeway system was built in a lot of cities those were built through communities of color um, and ended up separating and dividing up those communities as you know if you've ever tried to cross from one side of a freeway to the other um, that can really break up a community and that sense of community for that group so that's just one example of a lot of different ways uh, in which systems of oppression work at that institutional level. At the cultural level, this refers to, systems of oppression refer to those shared values, beliefs, and norms that shape, uh, well, the cultural level refers to shared values, beliefs, and norms that shape societal expectations and behavior. And that can perpetuate stereotypes, normalize inequality, and reinforce the dominance of privileged groups. Normalizing inequality is one that's particularly interesting to me because 
what I, I do find a lot of people who will understand that it's unfortunate that certain communities uh, don't have access to the same resources and opportunities as others, but then also just think of it as like, well, that's just the way the world is. Um, so normalizing doesn't necessarily mean that we agree with it, but it means that we can just accept it as well. So some of the key characteristics of systems of oppression are that they have an unequal power distribution. Privileged groups hold more power and resources, while marginalized groups experience limited access and opportunities. Systematic dis discrimination is another key characteristic. Marginalized groups face disadvantages and barriers in various, various aspects of life due to their social identities. Normalization of inequality in the systems, the system often operates invisibly, making it difficult to recognize and to challenge it. And it's important, again, that we are intentional when we look at things in a critical way to identify those barriers that are that exist and ways in which our systems make it more difficult or easier for certain groups to access resources. Another characteristic is that a system of oppression has unearned advantages and disadvantages. Privilege grants unearned benefits to certain groups, while oppression imposes unearned disadvantages on others. While we're talking about these key characteristics of systems of oppression, I'd like to point out um, that when you look at these characteristics uh, and put them together, this is why there is no such thing as reverse racism. Because in order to have a system of oppression like racism, which is a system, it's not just one individual's feelings. Uh, in order to have a system of racism, a group has to have a power over someone else, a systematic discrimination, that normalization of inequality, and those unearned advantages and disadvantages. So you can be, you can discriminate against a person who is white, but you can't be racist against a person that is white, if that makes sense. So let's take an exercise here. Let's take one of these systems of oppression and think through what it effect has, what effects it has. So let's take sexism. I want you to take a moment to think of what are the social, economic, and political ways in which sexism affects women. And Andy, if you wouldn't mind at this point, kind of helping me as I discuss through this. Um, this is an exercise for all of us, not just uh, for you, but for me as well and all of us. Um, what are some social ways in which sexism affects women? Socially, how do we value women? So some folks in chat are saying um, lower pay for same role. Yeah, it's an economic impact, right? Which ties also to that social impact of sexism. Mm. Politically, not only are the majority of lawmakers, you know, and policymakers uh, and political leaders male, 
but the actual political system is designed by males. So women have had very little input in the way that our political system works. I recently saw a meme that I found really interesting. That said, like, someone really pulled one on us when we decided that a woman that stays at home, maintains the household, cooks, cleans, takes care of the children, gets them to school, uh, makes lunch for her husband, is somehow not employed or not working. Now, what are some of the social, economic, and political ways in which sexism affects men? And socially, we view men as more of a leader uh, in a lot of our societies and culture. Economically, men tend to have more opportunities. And like we talked about political systems, uh, you know, men tend to have more control over policies uh, and laws and the political system, even in issues that mostly affect women. Or issues that affect all other genders, really. So now we've talked a little bit about intersectionality, uh, about systems of oppression. I'd like to go back to intersectionality. So again, just to review a little bit, intersectionality helps us understand how different forms of oppression can combine and create complex challenges for, an in, for individuals and groups. It's like different layers and they all fit together to shape someone's overall experience. And intersectionality really does mean that intersection. Where does your gender and your race, your education, your social economic status, where does it all meet? And how does that affect the way that you experience the world? And it's going to be unique for every single person. One of the things that we teach when we talk about being trauma-informed in care is that every person has a unique experience. And that speaks to intersectionality, uh, the fact that we all have different life experiences and we'll see the world differently. Because of that, I often like to say that one of the terms I really dislike is common sense, that something is common sense. Well, in that situation, it's only common sense that you would do this or that you should do that. Because of the way that we experience the world and those different layers um, intersect, what is common sense to you may not be common sense to somebody else. And that is an issue that I see uh, sometimes when I'm out in the field uh, working with some individuals. And it can be frustrating. And it's natural to, to have frustrating when someone doesn't see things the way you do. But that's why it's so important to understand intersectionality, that, to understand that people see the world differently. And how do people see the world differently? For exa one example I like to share is that imagine if in our language there was no word for owning something. If you couldn't own anything, how different, how would that impact the way you look at the world?
So let's do a, a little exercise here. So here we have two individuals and I'm gonna go through some of their characteristics and I want you to think about how each of these characteristics might affect the way each of these individuals experiences uh, their, their life. First of all, they're both male. How does that affect the way you experience the world? I was just talking with a coworker mentioning how as a male, it took a long time before I recognized the additional steps that women and trans and non-gender binary individuals have to take in order to feel safe every day. Let's say one of these individuals is white. How would that affect the way they look at the world? Let's say the other individual is black. How different would their experience be? Let's say that one lives, the one on the left lives in an urban setting. And then the one on the right lives in a rural setting. Let's say that one is poor, lives in poverty. Someone said, when women take leadership roles and they state opinions or attempt to enforce rules or policies, they're seen as emotional, Dis like decisions versus leadership decisions, and their guidance or opinion is not taken as serious as if a man made the same recommendation or action. Very clear in leadership books, for women, um, leaders are sold as self-help since women need to fix um, something about themselves and men. Uh, they are sold as leadership or how to have more power, but the, the content may be similar, um, such as change in perception that is woven throughout our culture. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. I've actually, I've been in meetings where a woman will say something and everyone just nods their head. And then a male will say the same thing a few minutes later and everyone will say, well, that's a great idea. We should do that. Uh, and I've been in meetings where I have a peer with me who is female, and we're meeting with a partner. And this was actually with someone who works in anti-violence and anti-oppression work. So I was really kind of shocked. Um, but the woman that was with me, my peer, was significantly younger uh, and, and female and a woman of color. And the gentleman that was representing the other organization would only look at me when he was speaking. And whenever she would speak, he would just look at her for a quick second and look away and then look to me to validate uh, what she was saying, even though I had only been in that job for two months and she'd been in that job for over a year. I'm sure you've seen stuff like that, Andy, right? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And even like age, um, how people see age and their, um, depending on their gender, mm -hmm. right? Or um, the difference between aggression and what's the other word? Assertive is your gender and your race. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've actually seen where... Um... In groups, even I, I saw in a group of several women leaders where the 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 women that were women of color would get ignored or overwritten no matter what they said. Uh, and the same thing would happen where they would say something. And then a few minutes later, one of the white 
females would say something and everyone would be like, that's a great idea. And I was shocked because they, they pointed it out to me like, watch, this is going to happen. I'm like, no way. And sure enough, it happened like three or four times within an hour and a half. Um, like, wow. Um, it's interesting. And I'm not saying that they were bad people. It's just so baked into the way we perceive and experience the world that we have to be really conscious of that. So back to this exercise here, you know, how do these different characteristics affect each of those individuals and how they would experience the world? Now, let's say that the one on the left is trans and the one on the right is cis hetero or cisgender. Now, if we were to look at one of these aspects and only see that person as that one thing, whether it's male or a person in poverty or a wealthy person, how much would we be missing in understanding that individual? And that's why that intersectional lens is so important. And when we take that, it I really believe that intersectional lens takes in intention. You have to be intentional about understanding these things. It doesn't mean crying and asking people for all those details, but as a person, as you create a space for an individual to speak to you, and if they feel safe and they start to disclose different things, uh, you know, taking those things into account and understanding how that may have affected uh, the way they're experiencing a situation, experiencing a situation. Now, let's say, let's take the per, one of these individuals and let's say that they're a woman instead of a male. Or that one of them is disabled. How would that affect, you know, the way they experience the world? And again, these things are just critical to understand when we're helping and supporting survivors. So why does intersectionality, ma intersectionality matter in sexual vi in the sexual violence movement? Because when it comes to supporting trauma survivors, it's critically important and necessary to understand that everyone's experience is different. We must recognize that things like race, gender, sexual orientation, and other parts of a person's identity all play a role in how they experience and heal from trauma. And in order to really have that intersectional lens, one of the primary things is to understand systems of oppression and the fact that they exist. It always concerns me when, I, when I'm training new advocates and I'll have someone who denies systematic oppression even exists. That scares me that they're going to go out there and cause harm to individuals if they don't fully understand what someone has experienced. Another thing with intersectional lens and, and sexual violence work is that without that lens, we can't truly provide trauma-informed care because we're not seeing the whole person. Also, without an intersectional lens, the fact is that we will cause harm. It's not a matter of we may cause harm. And it doesn't mean that you're going to experience someone and act in a sexist way or racist way necessarily, which very well could happen, or you might not see what a person needs. But when we don't have an intersectional lens, there will be people who won't even come to us who need help. And that is a form of causing harm when we don't have that equal access to individuals. And it's challenging. It's something that I see a lot of organizations want to do, um, but don't know how to do it. 
how do we have an intersectional lens to the work that we're doing? An intersectional lens is critical for our work because a survivor's healing journey needs to address not just the trauma itself, but also the systems of oppression that made them more vulnerable in the first place. And that's a big part that I think we don't always recognize. We have to recognize and address the sexism, the racism, the ageism, the you know ableism that may make a person more vulnerable in the first place. As someone who cares a lot about primary prevention, uh, and for those who don't understand primary prevention or may not be familiar with the term, primary prevention is preventing violence in particular in my field, sexual violence before it even occurs. So it's not an intervention where we're stopping it when it starts. It's stopping it before it even starts. An anecdote I like to share to kind of explain that uh, is when I was working at a local rape crisis center as a prevention coordinator, I had a local martial arts studio reach out and offer to give free lessons to individuals. Uh, and they contact me because I'm the prevention person. And I was really grateful. I'm like, that's awesome. Like, that's great. Let's, uh, you know, that you, that you care about this and you want to do this. But let me connect you to somebody else because that's not really what I do. Uh, and so it was one of those like light bulb moments when I explained to them that, that what I'm actually going for is not that everyone knows how to defend themselves or carries mace around. What I'm aiming for is that you don't, have to have martial arts skills uh, or carry mace with you that you should be safe and secure to live your life without the threat of even being assaulted and in order to do that we have to dismantle those systems of oppression that make people more vulnerable in the first place that's the reason why women experience sexual violence at higher rates than men why women of color experience sexual violence at higher rates than white women, why trans women experience, and especially black trans women experience sexual violence at higher rates than black women. All these things that make these systems of oppression make individuals more vulnerable and more susceptible, more likely, fortunately, to experience sexual violence. So we really care to end sexual violence. We really have to end sexual violence uh, at all levels. Like the day the person who is most vulnerable is free of the threat of sexual violence, we all will be free of the threat of sexual violence. Because sexual violence is an act of power and control over someone else. Someone felt entitled to exercise power and control over someone else's body. Or we say it's, it's not a crime or an act of lust. Because lust is normal, but lust doesn't mean you assault someone. A sense of entitlement to having power and control over others is the very bedrock on which violence is founded. Where we dehumanize someone or less humanize someone, if you will. It tends to normalize or justify violence. And those systems of oppression, again, justify and normalize one group or some group having power and control over another. And if you look at history, you look at the world now, you'll see it over and over again.
there is, uh, and I should have included this, I, I think I meant to, uh, a pyramid of rape culture, which is a graphic that shows how rape culture it works or how it's built. Um, at the very top is murder and rape, extreme forms of violence. Um, towards the bottom, you have uh, things like harassment uh, or inappropriate jokes or uh, locker room talk, things that kind of build a foundation under that. But under those things, those attitudes, uh, uh, those behaviors are sexism, racism, ableism, all these things that, again, build that bedrock on which everything else goes on top and so in order to dismantle or to eliminate sexual violence we have to work at eliminating that very foundation and that's why anti-rape work is anti-oppression work there's no way around that We can't end sexual violence without also fighting and ending the systems of oppression that affect us all in different ways. And really, honestly, they affect and harm us all. Even those who might seen as, be seen as benefiting from it or benefit from it also are, are hurt. For example, the way we socialize men, right? Um, we may have a system of patriarchy, you know, where men have tend to have more power, more um, and control over other individuals. But having to be that powerful, controlling person leads to men not being believed when they report having experienced sexual violence, or even feeling like they can't admit to it or accept the fact that they have been, you know, harmed in that way. Recently, when I'm working on male survivor uh, presentations, I've been really kind of driving home the point that uh, what, what harms uh, a lot of men is the sexist attitudes, right? Where, uh, a man, if, if you're not a man, you you get throw you get slurs thrown at you that are sexist and homophobic. Um, and whether we know it or not, uh, or intend it that way or not, the message that is sending is that the worst thing you can be as a man is a woman or someone that's gay. Um, and so those systems end up pushing men back into their box in a way um and and don't allow men to fully express themselves or show vulnerability a lot of times or seek help that's a big one um i mean we all heard the cliche right about not wanting to pull over and ask for instructions for directions when we're lost um and so not being able to show that weakness uh, or seeking help really harms men as well as other individuals, the ones that we see as the oppressed as well, or, or are the oppressed groups. So how do we apply an intersectional lens to our work? There's so a couple of ways um, that we would recommend, first of all, centering those marginalized voices, challenging stereotypes and biases, tailoring services and support, advocating for systematic change, building coalitions and solidarity, and educating and raising awareness. And I would say educating and raising awareness uh, for ourselves as well as for others. So what does centering marginalized voices mean? It means to prioritize the leadership and expertise of survivors from marginalized communities, including women of color, LGBTQ plus individuals, disabled individuals, immigrants, and others. This means actively seeking their input, valuing their perspective, 
and super critical is creating spaces where they feel safe and empowered to share their experiences, where they feel comfortable expressing even their fears or their concerns and feeling empowered as well. Like when, if they say something, do we act on it or do we just say, well, we did our part. We listened to them. It's difficult. Even some of the most like progressive and, you know, organizations that I've worked with and, and want to improve in this field have a difficult time. So it is something that we have to continuously work at. And if something's not working, try something else. Another way that we apply intersectional and start work is by challenging those stereotypes and biases, you know, recognizing this mantle harmful stereotypes and biases that perpetuate discrimination and marginalization of survivors. That includes challenging assumptions about who is a typical survivor who constitute real assaults and who is deserving of support and justice. Those are a lot of words, and it can be very easy to nod your head or agree to that, but it takes real intentionality and work, to, and you have to sit down and think about that. And a lot of times, we won't see those harmful stereotypes or biases because they're blind spots for us. So this, all of these connect together, that centralizing those marginalized voices is critical to challenging our stereotypes and biases. Tailoring service and support is another way that we apply an intersectional lens, providing culturally relevant and accessible services that meet the unique needs of diverse survivors. This might involve offering support groups specifically for LGBTQ survivors, providing interpretation service for non-English speakers, or ensuring physical accessibility for disabled survivors. And again, like I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> something I unfortunately have seen, <clears throat> and I'm guilty of this as well, uh, is that the last thing I think about, if I even do, is individuals with disabilities. So being <clears throat> very mindful and having those voices at the table and then feeling safe being able to tell you how they feel uh, will help you identify those barriers that exist, which is critical again to our work. Another aspect is- Jorge, there was a, oh, yeah? just a quick question. What are your thoughts on requesting bias evaluations upon hire of staff in this work? That one's a tough one. It is. Uh, <clears throat> Because here's the interesting thing, bias uh, tests tend to not be very accurate and not always be very clear as to what they're actually um, measuring. Does that make sense, uh, Andy, or have you heard of that? Oh, yeah, for sure. Like the implicit um, bias test, mm -hmm. um, it can... The thing is with implicit bias tests is it can give us good information about like a population, a, a community, a region, um, but it doesn't really tell us a lot about individual folks like uh, places that have um, more negative attitudes towards like brown and black folks will have, you know, more like police violence and, and stuff like that in their in their communities and stuff. And so on, on, a, on a bigger scale it, it can be helpful but on a smaller scale it's it's not not as helpful as we maybe want it to be yeah as a matter of fact that's why when when the same individual will take the same implicit bias test they'll get different results um because implicit bias is so deeply embedded that honestly i have my doubt you can get rid of your implicit bias what i think you need to have is the humility uh to accept that you have it and and work against it or like recognize it and put it aside um because i know i have it uh you know in all kinds of different ways um and so 
when when it comes to new staff, because this is an issue I've seen Camden with uh, with advocates that are going through the training uh, that sometimes they cannot get over their biases. Um, and I'm going to ask Andy, which are the the modules in our 40 hour training that cause the most uproar in our training? And Andy's gonna, I'm sure it's going to say the same, very same ones I'm thinking of right now. Okay, are we going to say it at the same time, Jorge? No, no. <laughs> so the ones that, um, I mean, I've been doing 40 hour trainings for, you know, years and years and years. I did it at my previous job for six years. So um, the ones that consistently have pretty significant pushback, um, you know, sometimes even aggression, um, lashing out and stuff like that, um, the top three are LGBTQIA+, advocating for Native survivors, and um, supporting uh, plural communities, survivors from uh, plural families. Those three, without a doubt, almost every single training are met with um, a lot of pushback. Yeah. And so, you know, when I'm looking at, when I'm, I get a pretty good sense a lot of times, especially if they're in person, which is why I love doing uh advocacy trainings in person I get more of a sense that you can read the room better um when I'm giving uh, you know th these are all new advocates entering the field so they're they're required to have this training to work and I have no problem with someone asking a problematic question or making a problematic statement when we're talking about something what I look for is are they willing to understand why it's problematic and and see it a different way that's almost more important because people are gonna have biases there's no way around that but when someone is stubborn um that's what scares me that's what worries me so it's that's almost more what i would measure with an individual that's going into this is their ability to recognize their biases And I've had, uh, I've actually, how do they say that? Because uh, this happens in LGBTQ presentation. I've heard it more than once. Uh, Andy, I, I can never quite say it right. When people say something like, well, I don't have to agree with it. Oh, yeah. I mean, it comes, yeah, it's said a couple different ways. And I've even had, like, facilitators when I've done trainings for folks, um, kind of reiterate the things that, that folks are saying, like, well, um, I don't have to agree with you to still do my job. And the things that like I present about in the LGBTQIA plus training are, you know, how to provide trauma informed care to LGBTQIA plus folks, treat them, you know, with respect and humanity and <laughs> see them as actual humans. Um, and that that's a that's a big that's a big problem, especially when you know people are saying that. And then it's really hard, almost impossible. If it, I don't even I don't personally believe it's possible to separate the art from the artist. Um, so, you know, when 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 folks are going through training and they're you know they have these you know beliefs and values, you know maybe it's like that's going to be really really difficult for them to provide. Um, effective and trauma-informed care to serve all survivors, and especially those from populations that they don't necessarily quote-unquote agree with, right? And that's that's really hard um, because they're going to have to fight every day to do their job um, because there's there's going to be people from groups that they don't you know care about, people they hate. There's bias towards them, so on and so forth. Um, and it's gonna it's gonna be really really difficult um, for them to do that. Um, yeah, I don't know if mm -hmm. that kind of answers that question, but yeah, no, I, yeah. I think it's critical that we uh, accept and understand other people's identities. Right? Yeah. Um, it's not up to us to decide whether your identity is valid or not. Um, that's not what we do as advocates. Um, so I'm glad you asked, Camden, because that is something that really worries me a lot. Like, are we being careful about how we hire people? Most people that come through the training, honestly, we get overwhelmingly positive reviews of our training. Uh, but almost without fail, there's always 
one or two or three individuals who do worry me a little bit uh, about like, you know, causing harm and causing harm doesn't necessarily mean that, again, you're going to be in the room and say something bad to uh, an individual like an HRT where you're going out uh, and meeting individuals. Yeah, it can happen that way. Uh, but in our service centers and our rape crisis centers, the harm can be just the fact that people don't feel safe getting the help they need. So it's not necessarily that you might do something to them. It's the fact that there's, there'll be an obstacle to them, to them accessing that service. Amy. Yeah, I, think, um, oh. I was just going to read what Amy, Amy mm -hmm. said, but um and then make a little comment on it. It comes down to just seeing them as humans deserving of respect, kindness, and our best efforts to help them. Um, and I think, you know, part of this training is that, n n you know, no one's being asked to be experts in every culture across the world, every culture that they come in contact with. That's pretty impossible, right? You're an expert in your own experience and not someone else's. Um, and that... The, the very basic part of our job is to provide trauma-informed care. And those basic principles are going to be your guiding light in that, right? It's meeting people where they're at. It's uh, supporting people, um, focusing on their strengths, building people up, right? Under, or better understanding um, and taking into account intersectionality. Um, yeah, and I'm going to get a little a little bit ahead of myself because we're talking about this right now. Uh, but, you know, having that empathy, compassion, and respect for others, right, is, is key to the work we do. Another way of saying that, that we tend to shy away from saying in our professional settings is centering love in our work. Think about that. Right. I, I like to say I don't have to like a person, but I'll still love them. Um, and so I think when we center love in our work, uh, which it's it's kind of incredible to think that saying that centering love in our work feels like a very radical statement uh, because it's a word that we shy away from. But just think about that and process that over the next couple of days. Okay, another way in which we apply intersectional lens is by building coalitions and solidarity, foster collaborations and solidarity among diverse groups and organizations working to end sexual violence. This includes building bridges between survivor advocacy groups, racial justice organizations, LGBTQ plus rights groups, disability rights organizations, and other such social justice movements. Uh, and here I'm going to give a shout out to Tyrell who's on here who asked me to make sure to plug in RAW, the uh, Restoring Ancestral Winds hotline. Uh, they help to provide services for uh, really indigenous survivors. Uh, they're the, the region's coalition that represents indigenous populations. And their number, uh, you can Google um, Restoring Ancestral Winds. Uh, their number is 1-833-688-4325. And I have groups, just recently I had one of our rape crisis centers contact us and say, how do we get in connection with the indigenous uh, populations in our community so they can be part of our coalition, which is awesome that they were thinking of that. But my first instinct was like, let, let me connect you with Raw. Uh, so if you ever have any questions, they're an amazing resource to make those connections. So thanks for reminding me, Tyrell. Oh, another thing also, back to this building coalition and solidarity, this is really important because there's there's no way that your space will ever be safe for everybody. Um, even organizations that are very conscious about trying to be as safe as possible, um, there'll be some groups that don't feel safe there. Um, so having that collaboration with groups that are already doing the work in those communities is critical to reach those individuals. Um, saying like, well, if you don't come to our building, you're not going to get services uh, is, is just not going to work for some groups. Um, one approach that we're 
uh, working with at UCASA right now is a program called uh, that we're starting called um, Promotoras. And so we have a group of women, uh, Latina women, who some of them work with other organizations such as Comunidades Unidas or Mujeres Unidas. Uh, they're already out in the community doing work and they're getting a 16 hour training on understanding sexual violence, how to respond to sexual violence, how to prepare presentations and give um, and speak publicly and, and how to give presentations. And I, I really love this approach because for years and years, we've offered Spanish hotlines, Spanish pamphlets, but we all know that we, we are just not reaching that population, right? So instead of uh, just doing the same thing over and over again, um, we're trying this approach of working with partners uh, that are already working with those groups. Um, and our, our goal is after we pilot this program, uh, being able to offer that kind of training to our local rape crisis center so they can develop their own promotoras programs in their region. Uh, because that is a challenge we have. Um, and it's not even just a challenge of trying and not reaching those individuals. We've had organizations that say like, oh, we don't need to worry about uh, the Latino population because we don't have them in our community, which is just shocking <laughs> to hear because they were in a very rural uh, agricultural area. And I personally had worked uh, with an organization that was going out and walking through the fields and handing resources to individuals out there, Latinos that were working in the in the fields and to hear them not say that they don't have them in their community. Again, that just shows how sometimes we have, we have those blind spots that we have to be careful with. And then the last way in which we recommend, you know, applying that intersectional lens to our work is educating and raising awareness, educating the public and professionals about the complexities of sexual violence and the importance of an intersectional approach. This involves providing training on cultural competency or cultural humility, as I like to call it, uh, trauma-informed care, and understanding the impact of multiple oppressions on survivors. All of that makes sense, right? Yeah, of course, we want to do that. Um, I think a lot of times in when we're working in our circles, we we kind of become a little bit of an echo chamber and we forget that not everybody sees the world the same way. And or we underestimate how few people understand sexual violence or even how how, how much it occurs. But I would like to highlight trauma-informed care because more recently over the last like year or two, I've been really thinking about trauma-informed care as something that we, we think about in our professional roles. Uh, but I, I challenge you and I keep challenging people to apply that trauma-informed approach to all your relationships. Um, what does trauma-informed parenting look like? You know, how could that look like in your friendships, in your churches, your schools? Um, for example, schools. I, I had a friend who uh, was a teacher and he had a student who was always falling asleep in his class. And he was getting really frustrated, you know, he's, and he told me like, it was, it was really frustrating to have this student. And it was a moment he was sharing because he had learned from this experience um, and he said, like, I would get so frustrated and I would yell at him. I'd keep him after after school to talk to him. Uh, and one day he disclosed that there was a domestic violence situation at home. And so he couldn't sleep at home. How does that affect that individual, right? When we know that, when we have that trauma-informed approach, we again we see the humanity, the good, the suffering, and everything that people might be experiencing, and meet them there. Um, Andy says that applying trauma informed care to my everyday life has been wildly beneficial. Yeah, for sure. And any of you who have heard me talk about this have heard me say how when I started applying this in my parenting, uh, I ended up becoming the parent that my kids go to when they're in trouble. 
uh, because they're like, that's not going to tell me I told you so, or what were you doing? That's going to say like, oh, I'm sorry. What? How can we fix this? I mean, they already feel bad enough already. If they've messed up, they don't need someone else kind of kicking them anymore. So I think if we have that trauma-informed care, and I don't know if we need to change the name of it uh, to something that's a little bit easier for people to understand, but if we had more trauma-informed approaches in the world, we'd have a much better world uh, in a lot of ways. So just to recap here, intersectionality helps us understand how different forms of oppression can combine and create complex challenges for individuals and groups. So when you sit down and really think about intersectionality and the different forms of oppression, it helps you see things that you can't see otherwise. And it's, it's an exercise you can do is sit down, you know, hear those voices and, and try to put that together. We're never going to fully understand somebody else's experience, but it helps us build that empathy, right? Um, it can also, though, help us to better support Oh, sorry, other typo there. Help us to better support survivors by understanding an individual's different sources of resilience and support. Because that's the thing. Like, it's not just oh, it's not just that people are oppressed. People find ways to develop resiliency, uh, and being able to recognize that, uh, and recognizing that we're not always going to be the source of healing for the individual. We we really have to be careful about not gatekeeping that way, that sometimes for an individual, their community may be where they find their healing. Um, for example, Andy spoke a little earlier about how uh, plural families module in our 40-hour training tends to cause some pushback. And a lot of it is attitude that like, oh man, we have to get them out of there. We have to get them out of there in order for them to heal. But sometimes that, you know, their, their families, their community is where they need to heal. Uh, and so we need to meet people where they're at. We keep saying that over, but what that mean, that's what it means is, you know, doing what's best for the survivor, not what we think is best for the survivor or what we think should be done. But also, and this is, what I find just beautiful about intersectionality. We talk about oppression, all these very negative things, but really it helps us to appreciate the uniqueness of every human being. And that can help to increase our empathy, compassion, and respect for others. When you, it's beautiful, beautiful to see the mosaic that builds a person. And when you respect that and understand that, you just love people more. And again, going back to that word love, right? It's what, what should be driving a lot of our work. So I want you to think of intersectionality as a positive thing. It's It makes you, again, appreciate all the nuances of being a human being, the ways in which we're ugly and the ways in which we're beautiful too. And in closing, um, you know, I've talked a bit about how anti-rape work is anti-violence work, is anti-oppression work. So I'd like to leave you with this quote from uh, Ikeoma Olua, who uh, is uh, a writer and self-proclaimed internet yeller. Um, and when she, I love this quote. And it's important that we think about this. You know, when we identify where our privilege intersects with somebody else's oppression, we'll find our opportunities to make real change. So I want you to process that. So with that, uh, thank you so much for being here. Again, um, we will be uploading this recording for if you want to share with any of your staff or any peers as well. And as always, you're welcome to reach out to us at UCASA. We're more than happy to help uh, in any way, uh, process things. We don't know all the answers. Nobody does. But if we don't, we'll work on it together with you. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you, Andy, for your support. 
and have a good rest of your day.